uh, I was asked to just talk about really the disasters that we sometimes uh, encounter with Achilles from uh, different types of treatment, but mostly surgical. I have no conflicts. And uh, we're talking about really more old ruptures uh, or, or neglected ruptures. And, and we do talk about bridging the gap because sometimes because of infection or other processes, there's bad tissue or, or there's no tissue in this area. I think it's really interesting how many of these are neglected, and Mark mentioned this as well, that maybe a quarter of these ruptures are not diagnosed by the primary care physician who see them. They don't even come to us. It would take so little just to grasp that uh, calf and diagnose this, uh, this defect. And of course, we have other problems. We have poor tissue. We have sometimes huge incisions, uh, neglect of the soft tissue that's there, and uh, sometimes the treatment requires an extensive exposure. Of course, uh, we know about complications, and these can be disastrous complications. And before you do any kind of reconstruction, you have to solve the initial problem, which is the wound breakdown. And I don't have a good plastic surgeon in my small community, and that's always been for my whole career a disaster, because if you do have this happen, you ship them off to Salt Lake or to Seattle or Portland or other points, and that's really a tough deal. Alistair gave me this case. This was not his operation, but it's one of the scariest complications I've seen. It looks rather benign. He said, you know, I got this from somewhere in the middle of Canada, and it came to Vancouver. It was a clostridia infection. I mean, that's about the scariest that I've seen, and he had to obviously debris this aggressively, put powder in, and he solved that problem before he went on to the reconstruction. So you have to eradicate the infection as you start on this, on this journey, and, and you may have to skin graft it, uh, and then your tendon uh, reconstruction is just down the line. And there are lots of things that are disclosed in the literature. This is historical in some respects, but I can just tell you I've seen them all and I, and I have some very strong feelings. I think sometimes you want some collagen in this area and a turn down flap may be something that you want to consider, but it's a big incision and you have major wound concerns as well. Uh, Jim DiOrio gave me this. This is a major turn down flap, as you see. I mean, it, it takes an incision that's probably three quarters of the calf and, uh, and put you at significant risk for a wound problem. A VY plasty was really hot in the 70s and 80s, and I can tell you that's just a long run for a short slide. It's really not worth it. And again, uh, Jim gave me this, and, and I mean, it's a, great, it's a great picture that you never want to have as one of your post-operative pictures. Uh, talks about allografts and synthetics. Most of us, and I wouldn't say most of us, but a lot of us don't want to put other stuff in there. It's already a big enough worry, and to put some, uh, some type of dermal matrix over the top and try to close that leaves you, I think, at risk for wound problems as well. Uh, the plantaris weave, it's always so disconcerting when you see how small it is, and then, of course, it's not there all the time. Historically, Vince Turco talked about using a perineus brevis, but it was an out-of-phase transfer. And then we got into other tendon transfers. Platt talked about a PTT. Roger talked about the FDL in the early 90s, but what really won the sort of the Nobel Prize was uh, Ted Hansen from Seattle and Keith Wapner from Philadelphia, who both sort of independently came to the fact that the flexor house, as long as was in the right place, was a very strong transfer, and it was a sacrifice that you had to make, but it was probably worth it. Initially, we'd go distal, and sometimes you still do because you want some more collagen for a big defect. And if you can, you can get a huge amount of uh, FDL that you can transfer. You free it up in the knot of Henry, which can be a little problematic, pull it proximal, do it. Usually, you come up with a, a guide pin across the heel, drill it, size the tendon. Sometimes you use an interference screw there as well, but use your ACL reamers, and you, you do a separate incision for the exit drill using a beef pin, as you see, I brought it up in sort of a Y-type um, uh, construct that we suture together. And, uh, but I think that uh, you will often reinforce it just in case that suture doesn't hold with a cross biotinodesis screw as well. And that's kind of what it looks like. And you are going from the calcaneus up about four inches, and there may be nothing else there. You've got some definite uh, collagen that you can use. I'm going to skip through the video just from an essence of time. But I think the single incision is really hot at this point, and I think that's what we like to do most of the time. And through the incision that you see here, you can harvest it just uh, above the tunnel where it courses on the medial aspect of the calcaneus. Uh, you fix it with a fiber loop to secure the tendon. You size it just like we did before. Then you go ahead and drill out the plantar aspect of the heel, trying to miss the fat pad. Drill with an ACL reamer, and I use it through and through. I think blind tunnels uh, leave you blind. 
And I think it's better to just go ahead and drill it all the way out, tension it the way you want to, and then put your uh, biotin adhesive screw in. Usually, if you look at the inferior right corner, the tendon disappears to just the muscular tendon junction, and that's about how tight you make that tendon uh, in, the, uh, in the bone, how you tension it. Then you put, go ahead and do your biotin adhesive screw, and then you start your reconstruction of the tendon itself. It's sort of the same thing as far as an Achilles tendon reconstruction with an open repair. You're kind of careful, but you really start them as six weeks to 12 weeks is when you start them recovering from this process. The results are actually fairly impressive. Brandon Hartog showed that people that sacrificed their FHL didn't really miss that plantar flexion of the IP joint. Probably the trade-off was great between that and just having a horrible Achilles tendon, and so they, they, they accepted it pretty nicely. Can you transfer the FHL alone? Well, you know, you really can. Wong showed that you could have a near normal gait pattern. And I just want to end up by just showing you a technique. When you really have bad skin and you have a bad problem there and you have no function of the Achilles, you can just do an arthroscopic tendon transfer. And uh, it was, uh, Finn had mentioned Louis' article, which was, which was certainly uh, the one that sort of paved the way. But you do that in a, in a prone position. It's actually fairly easy to go in and see that FHL that's just in the, in the, ten, the, the, uh, the tunnel itself. You, you grasp it, detach it, and then you can actually bring it out through the wound and put the same kind of suture construct that you did when it was open. You go ahead then and you debride that area and you drill your calcaneal drill hole just like we did before, but doing it percutaneously under fluoro control. Coming out the planter aspect, you can drill all the way through tension it just like we did before and fix it with a, a biotin adhesive screw and tension it very nicely with some small incisions. And that's when somebody's had a bad infection and you go, I just cannot open this up. There's a lot of scarring and you want to have some function back. And FHL can really make this person much more functional. Uh, they don't need a brace and they, they really have a nice gait pattern. So the post-operative uh, uh, techniques are exactly the same. You just, uh, they're really out of protection at 12 weeks. So I think the indications are an old rupture. It's not an old rupture, it's just a missed rupture or delayed treatment, prior infection, thin skin or bad skin, skin contracture, collagen disease, and you really avoid complications. So an FHL in conclusion gives you great strength to transfer. It's probably the best of all tendons to transfer. And choice on technique, you can do two incision or one incision or an endoscopic as well. Thank you.